Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel, and today we're going to be exploring the mysteries of... Siberia is something that captures our imagination for a variety of reasons. It's very interesting to consider the fact that Siberia is not often discussed directly in historical studies, despite the fact that many of the known lands encompass Siberia. And there's a very definitive question as to why this is. When we think of Siberia, our minds go to an imagination of wondrous mountains and cold frozen tundras. And for people who are into studying World War II and the communist regime, they think of the terrifying gulags. Yet there's much more extensive aspect to Siberia than what may reach the mind. For one, it's the mere size of this geographical area. It's also the fact that there are many coincidences when it comes to Siberia. In fact, if you look up coincidence and what you actually observe in Siberia, well, they should probably add it to the dictionary. Naturally, they won't. Very stunning rock formations that do not match simple explanation. Although our esteemed scientists and historians will tell us there is a natural explanation for all of these rock formations, and there is nothing mysterious at all about Siberia. In this exploration, we're going to take a different look at the perspectives of some of these rock formations. We're also going to consider how Siberia relates to our studies of the old world and previous civilizations. The mainstream does acknowledge that there are previous civilizations in Siberia, but of course they have a very different perspective of them than what we're going to be looking at today. Well, let's begin our exploration going down the cold and frozen road to learn the truth of Siberia. Let's begin by taking a look at Siberia and Russia. Now, we just explored Moscow earlier this week, and we see that Moscow is on the western end of this vast tract of land. Now, how large is Siberia? Well, depending on the exact source, you'll see anywhere from 4.9 to 5 million square miles. How exactly large is that? Well, Siberia, as you can see, comprises the vast amount of territory of the Russian Federation. Or for comparison, it is one-third larger than the entire land area of the United States and one-fourth larger than the entire land area of Canada. And looking at that, you can see why that's true. We also have a very suspicious area here that looks like that it's been bombed out or subjected to some terrific forces. Now, of course, we'll have the scientific explanation that'll tell us that this is because of the extreme cold, this is from some sort of permafrost or erosion, the usual culprits when we look at land areas such as this. However, I find such a land area very suspicious because it does look like it's been struck by something from the air, but perhaps, as we always say, it's just a coincidence. Anyone can see, though, that this is a vast tract of land, and it comprises a very large area. In fact, nearly one-tenth of all the lands in the known world are in Siberia. Looking at the Urbano Monte map from 1587, we can see that he did depict lands up at the North Pole. And in our recent explorations to include St. Petersburg and Moscow, we can see potentially how a pre-existing civilization that may have started in those lands could have expanded and reach the northern areas of what is now Russia. And in fact, we can see here the northern area of Siberia. A lot of questions and a lot of coincidences that seem to arise with this. Now, looking at many other maps, we'll see that the area is oftentimes listed as Tartaria. And the mainstream tells us that this is actually just Greater Tartary, that there was never any such nation called Tartaria. Well, I'm going to say on this particular exploration, it really doesn't matter what it was called. What matters is the fact that we're talking about a vast tract of land that has pre-existing civilizations associated with it, which the mainstream acknowledges, and we're going to be looking at that. Looking overall at Siberia, though, we can see that this vast tract of land that is larger than the United States and larger than Canada has different components to it. We have the West Siberian Plain, which is just east of the Ural Mountains. Now, the traditional definition of the divide between Asia and Europe is said to be the Ural Mountains. There are some other sources that will tell you it's other mountains, and maybe we just need to have Superman fly down there and verify where the fault line actually is. It's one gigantic landmass. That's the important thing. The Siberian Plateau in central Siberia. And then here in northeast Siberia with the Kamchatka Peninsula. Always an area that was known historically because this is where it bordered near Alaska. 
But there's just so many lands and so many different rivers and unexplored areas, we'll be assured that it is explored. And when I said earlier that there's not much of a historical association, it always feels as though the studies of history tend to dance around Siberia. You'll hear little references to it in the railroad and the main route, and people always talked about people as in historians, official historians, if you want to call them that. They would always discuss the Siberian route and how critical and strategic it was, especially during conflicts of the past and the old Silk Road and the trade route. And you can see why Moscow would be such a strategic city looking at that route. Well, we start by looking at the beautiful Lena Pillars. These pillars are all 150 to 300 meters or 490 to 980 feet high. This runs along the Lena River. We will be told, in fact, we will be assured ad nauseum by our scientists, our geologists, that this is a natural rock formation. And it's quite a puzzling enigma to begin the exploration with, because when you look at all these rock formations, you can't help but realize just how uniform they are. Why exactly are they referred to as pillars? Well, you probably get an explanation if you ask a geologist, it's because they look like pillars. And when you look at how extensive and how far this goes on the Lena River, you can't help but realize that these are pillars. And these formations appear at various places for miles and miles. Yet looking a little bit more closer at them, we see a more fine geometrical symmetry to them. What is really going on here? And as if you need any more suspicion to this Lena pillar area, consider the fact that this is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And looking here at this chart, we can see the number of UNESCO World Heritage Sites that are registered each year, supposed to have cultural significance. Why exactly does a natural rock formation have cultural significance? In fact, in my mind, this is even more suspicious than if they just said that this was a large golf course. Although, looking at this very well-shaped rock pillar that was formed naturally, consider how difficult a game of golf might be if you're trying to tee off on the top of that. The thing that I find surprising though looking at these pillars is just how uniform they are. And also consider that their height has a very unique coincidence to it. And once again, if you're going to accept the fact that this is a natural rock formation, you also have to accept the fact that there are many coincidences that are associated with it. Now what exactly am I referring to? Well you look at the fine structure behind these pillars. There's the fact that they call them pillars. And no matter what angle you look at them from, you have to overlook the fact that erosion is supposed to leave things in a fine rounded shape. Well, it only does until it's not supposed to. And there's always exceptions to every rule. And I understand that. But is there any other place in the land that you're going to see pillars that are formed like this? Pillars that are formed by natural forces that look like pillars to this extent. We've done other explorations where we've questioned what we see in buildings that we know were very clearly made by artificial means. And yet, looking at these pillars, we're told that these are natural. Also consider what they tell us that these pillars are made out of. They tell us that these pillars are made primarily out of limestone. And of course, there's some other stones that they say are factored into it. But looking at them a little more holistically, we see that actually examining these in person, I wonder what kind of material, what kind of composition we'd find. And I'm not some person to rely on some filled or carved machine to tell me exactly what the composition of a building material is. I prefer to actually get on the ground and examine it. And I have to say, I've added the Lena pillars to my areas that I would like to do an on-site exploration of. Because when you look at this, there's just too many fine details to simply write off as coincidence. Now, do I know exactly what happened? Can I say beyond any shadow of a doubt that I know what the origin of these Lena pillars truly are? No, I don't. But I think it's interesting, and there's far too many coincidences to simply overlook this as a natural rock formation. How much uniformity do you truly need to at least want to go and explore something a little bit closer? And what really is the cultural heritage with it? Is this just an area in Siberia where people go by on riverboats and they say, look, there's the Lena Pillars. We're not actually going to get off, although it does look like the boat tour allows you to get off and explore them a little bit more closely. It's a very intriguing rock formation. And it's more than a coincidence in the fact that there's a vast amount of limestone that they say is in this rock formation. It's also more than a coincidence concerning the uniformity of these so-called pillars, especially when you look at them from the top down. Once again, we see many vertical lines that are very straight. 
Well, I guess it just flies right in the face of the old saying that God does not build in straight lines. I guess according to scientists, while God may not build in straight lines, natural forces build in very straight lines. And they build in great uniform straight lines, which go along for miles of a river. Hmm, what else do we know that's along rivers? Oh yeah, they prefer to park cities on rivers for some reason. I guess it has something to do with logistics and transportation and those sort of mentalities that only apply when we're told they apply. But what do you make of the Lena Pillars? What exactly do you make of this very puzzling rock formation? Let me know in the comments. And as always, I'm open to all perspectives. I'll point out one more coincidence. When you consider the average height of skyscrapers from the 1890s, when we're told that the skyscraper was innovated and implemented, consider what the ideal and usable height of a skyscraper is. And we'll be told that it's anywhere from 300 to 900 feet. Now, we do have taller skyscrapers, such as the Burj Khalifa, or Burj Khalifa. Yes, Dr. Davidson, I'm thinking of you. When you see the fact that a lot of this, though, is considered unusable space in these skyscrapers. In fact, the usable height from the skyscrapers just happens to correspond with the height of the Lena Pillars. Now, that's one significant coincidence, I think. Also, consider the fact that Every single Lena pillar, add that up as a separate coincidence, is the ideal usable height of a skyscraper. And isn't it interesting here that uh, our great forces of authority are telling us that these are considered vanity heights for these skyscrapers. There's a lot of the Burj Khalifa that you can't actually use because it's just too tall, along with many other buildings. Unless, of course, you plan to provide rental space to a group of wasps. And you allow the wasps to build their nests up there, and I'm sure wasps have a good AAA credit rating. And perhaps that's why they built the vanity height on these buildings. So it's quite a coincidence. How many coincidences total do you think there are with the Lena Pillars? Let me know in the comments. Or is it all just a natural formation? The Gornia Shoria Megalis, another natural formation. A rock formation that of course has theories in terms of how it formed. Scientists and geologists will assure us that these are a natural rock formation. Prior to going into this exploration, though, of the so-called megaliths, let's take a look at Baalbek back in Lebanon. Now, we know, and the mainstream confirms beyond any shadow of a doubt, that this is an artificial site. The Romans supposedly quarried these incredible stones and built this Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek, Lebanon. And we have verification that this is an artificial site from the mainstream. Well, let's take a look at the megaliths in Gornia Shoria, back in Siberia. And when you look on the top, you can see what appears to be a very extensive wall structure. Now, I know, that's my imagination running wild. We are assured by our mainstream account that this is a natural rock formation. And as you can see, it's another natural rock formation that has a lot of very defined horizontal lines in it. And I'm sure that this is the causes of erosion and that this has been the natural effects that happen all this time. Once again, while God may not build in straight lines, science most certainly can build in straight lines in a natural format. And here you can get an idea for just the size of this rock formation. And it's very impressive that however these megaliths or rocks were formed, that they seem to hold together so well and they have such a structural integrity with them, especially with not just fine horizontal lines, but these ones also have very suspicious vertical lines, or perhaps I should just say very peculiar vertical lines within these very large stones. Now, of course, what the mainstream will tell us is that the very suggestion that these megaliths are artificial is merely a fringe thought. It's always a fringe theory because they will tell us. Now, while no one in the mainstream actually saw exactly how these formed, you just have to go with your intuition and realize that what you're looking at is a natural formation. It's a very impressive natural formation. And I have to say, some of these lines are far more straight and far more precise than anything that we'd see in artificial formations. So perhaps the conclusion we can take from this is that these natural rock formations have to be natural because the vertical and horizontal lines are far more precise than what we'd have in an artificial construction. Once again, this is another site that I would like to get to and explore in person, because as I said earlier, I don't rely on any kind of Feldercarb technology to tell me exactly what the composition of the material is. I would like to verify that for myself. But we can see that the 
structural strength of these megaliths has to be something beyond what would normal forces be subjected to and why is that because we're told that this structure excuse me this natural rock formation has stood the test of time and of course we'll be told that it's for millions of years millions of years of natural weathering and erosion that forms these very precise and exceptional lines that we see in this formation now you can accept the scientific explanation you can realize that they have to utilize theories to explain how this formed and of course the perception of how they make those theories is certainly not intellectual cheetah flips i recall having many discussions with geologists in my past life about how many of these rock formations formed and they always seem to be going back and forth on what the theory is well is it some sort of use of rock is it some sort of spheroidal forces yes they'll come up with new words that they seem to innovate on the fly to come up with theories for how these rock formations are truly formed and i'm not going to go so far as to suggest that this is an artificial formation because i'll let you look at the images and come to your own conclusions is it artificial is that just a fringe theory or is it truly natural as we're told this is one of many sites in siberia we're only really looking at two today and there are many more there are many more megaliths and there are many more pillars to be seen across Siberia. But if you accept the fact that there might be a possibility that these could be artificially formed, then what sort of force would it have taken to cut and move these blocks? Now we admit that the blocks at Baalbek and Lebanon were cut artificially and moved. But these, of course, were formed by natural processes. And I know I'm emphasizing that quite extensively, but you have to recall that this is exactly what we're told by the mainstream account. They have to emphasize it. They have to come up with theories that they constantly change for how these rocks formed. And that's exactly what they do. So when you look at them and when you consider all of these theories for how these natural rock formations formed, you realize that it feels as though the account is constantly changing. And what does that tell you about the validity of an account if it's constantly changing? And the fact that the mainstream is trying to come up with theories to explain this. It means they do not have an explanation. It means that there could be another explanation for the formation of these megaliths. Now, does this mean that all of society came from Siberia originally? could be possible. It could also mean that they're the remnants of a previous civilization that existed in Siberia. Now, what kind of civilization would possess the capability to do something like this? To actually cut, form, and move stone of this size. And who knows if this was stone originally, perhaps this was something else. But again, another series of questions and just a lot of theories. There's also many different entrance points that you can't help but realize look artificial. And I find it fascinating that the series of theories oftentimes seems to be revolving from whether it's the work of water, whether it's the work of seismic forces that just happen to form all these very fine vertical and horizontal lines within these stones. And there we have this gentleman again here pointing out these stones again. Well, I've got to say, I'd probably call this guy before I'd call Jeremiah Johnson. I think he'd be a much more trustworthy survivalist guide than Robert Redford if you're stuck out in the Siberian wilderness. It's another thing to consider is just how vast Siberia is, and yet in the middle of it, in these vast lands, you have these extraordinary rock formations. Rock formations that just happen to have very fine vertical and horizontal lines, cut in them by what scientists will tell us are natural forces, whether it's erosion, water, or seismic forces, or some combination of some unique word that you haven't heard before that's been innovated to explain a theory. This is one of my favorite ones here with this little tower. Yes, I'm just trying to ponder the natural forces that would have formed a tower of rock like this. It's quite an extraordinary explanation. And then going back to what we saw in Baalbek, you don't see any consistencies, do you? And yes, my sarcasm meter is turned up to 10 once again. Because in the large stones and works of Baalbek, and you'll also see other sites that look like quarries across the land, you just simply can't explain this away by saying there's a rational, natural, scientific explanation for it. I mean, you can, but at some point, are you really just willing to accept whatever you're told because that's easier? 
as opposed to being naturally inquisitive, which I will say is a natural human trait, to figure out exactly what happened here? Or do you suppress it? Do you just accept what their explanation is? Instead of being able to operate in an area of ambiguity or ambivalence towards what the real origin of this is. I do admit that this could be a natural formation. Do I think that's very likely? What I'm seeing does not indicate that it is very likely. That is a lot of coincidence again. Add up the number of coincidences, just like we did with the Lena Pillars. How many coincidences do you get for the formation of every straight, vertical, and horizontal line? And then you add up all the coincidences of both these sites together. And keep in mind, we're only looking at two sites in Siberia. I assure you, there are plenty more that we can explore. Now let's take a look at some of the artifacts within Siberia. We're told by the mainstream that there was a very stunning Bronze Age civilization that was in Siberia. And the artifacts prove it. This is a very interesting figure that I've never quite seen before. And it's an intriguing aspect. Now, could this archaeological... The whole concept of archaeology is intriguing. Now, I can't verify that these artifacts were dug up in Siberia. We're assured that they are. And the research that I did says that these are all artifacts from a Bronze Age civilization. And if they are true, it's very impressive, some of the fine detailing that you have on them. It's also interesting to note that the mainstream does indicate that there was a previous civilization that existed in Siberia. And of course, they'll tell us that it was a Bronze Age civilization. Now, let's recall that the pyramids, we're told by the mainstream, was constructed during the Bronze Age. So, if they were to admit that the megaliths that we just looked at earlier were an artificial formation, they'd have to confabulate some sort of elaborate explanation for how they managed to build those megaliths. Perhaps they brought in a lot of water and floated all the stones in place. And they cut them. And people spent generations and generations of cutting the stones. Looking at some of the artifacts, though, you do see some impressive touches. This is a very intriguing creature. And what exactly is this supposed to represent here? Also, the fine workmanship on this, if this is in fact a legitimate artifact. Now, you'll ask the question, all right, Aurelian, why are we looking at artifacts that may or may not be legitimate? It's always interesting to consider what the mainstream account tells us, because it seems clear that there are a lot of hints that are given in the mainstream account, and yet at the same time, we're also given conflicting information, conflicting theories. So it feels as though a lot of what we're presented is legitimate and there is a lot of aspects that we can verify on site it's one of the reasons why i'm a big fan of on-site explorations you'll even see that they claim to have found what was a very developed and very interesting warrior they say this was a woman who was wearing some very elaborate jewelry in this account and that they dug they dug up this jewelry and it seems to be that it still fits quite fine to this day now Here's a person modeling the jewelry. Does this look like something that some sort of Bronze Age civilization would be able to form and do just like this? Well, I guess if you believe that the pyramids were constructed, as we're told, in a Bronze Age, then yes, anything was really possible. And maybe the question we should be asking is, how exactly far has the capability of humanity fallen since the Bronze Age? But of course, we don't simply accept that explanation on this channel. We look for other explanations and other theories. Now, was this really just a burial? Was this just some random skeleton that they found and looked at the site and then decided to associate that story with this? It's all entirely possible. That's always the thing when you're looking at archaeological sites. Yet some of the worksmanship that you see on this seems as though it's beyond the imagination of somebody to contrive in this day and age. Because we see a bit more of something that shows a creative inspiration and something that seems a little bit closer to the genuine human spirit with some of the artwork. So I suspect that a lot of it may be legitimate. Yeah, stone tools that look very advanced. There's almost a modern component to this, especially looking at that dagger. Now, is that just my imagination running wild? If these were tools that were from a previous civilization, what forces have they been subjected to over time? Well, let's look at the most alluring mystery of Siberia. Tunguska event. Through a fisheye lens, we have an account that a meteor, and I recall the original account being a comment, struck, or didn't strike Siberia, but exploded in the atmosphere above it. 
It's funny how this account seems to have changed many times over the years, but I know scientists are always exploring and looking at it. This is the exact location in Siberia of where the so-called Tunguska event occurred back in 1908, so at the start of the 20th century. Now, there's a lot of explanations given for it, and here's the official account. The Tunguska event devastated 770 square miles of forest in Siberia near the Tunguska River on June 30th, 1908. The blast power is estimated to be equal to 30 megatons of TNT. We'll look at that in a second. Knocked down 80 million trees, created a quake that was a 5-0 on the Richter scale. Despite having 1,000 times the energy of an atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, no impact crater. The true cause remains a mystery. And this shows the effect of the area. And it also shows the effect of this earthquake that was 5.0 on the Richter scale. Another interesting thing to consider is that uh, the official authorities and the scientists at that time didn't actually get in to look at this until nearly 20 years later. Don't you find that interesting? There are many different accounts on the ground of what the very sparse population saw in Siberia. The sky split in two, fire appeared high and wide over the forest, couldn't bear it, shirt was on fire, then trees were falling, branches were on fire, became mighty bright, and it's as if there was a second sun. Where have we heard that explanation before or description of such a sight? Now, it's gone back and forth if it actually impacted. We're assured that no object impacted. I recall when I originally entered academia that they thought this was a comet and a comet that exploded in the atmosphere. Well, now they've changed it to a meteor. Now, this is not an actual photo from what happened. It's an interpretation, but something else to be aware of. The event was also observed from Northern Ireland at an observatory, and that was well over 3,500 miles away from Tunguska. And they said that it left a nocturnal glow that you could still read a newspaper at after midnight. So what was really going on here with this Tunguska event? Was this really an exploding meteorite, as we're told? And of course, what... The scientific expedition on the ground found was there were trees that were flattened, but they couldn't find an impact crater. So you would think that indicates an airburst detonation. But what if there was an entirely different explanation for this Tunguska event? What if this was some sort of piece of old technology that had been set off at that time? Destructive technology that was designed to level what remained of any civilization to be found within Siberia. Another thing I always find interesting is the strategic importance of Moscow. Going back to the Napoleonic Wars, there's a conflicting account as to what the actual capital of Imperial Russia was. It was Moscow. No, it was St. Petersburg. Both cities that we've looked at in explorations. Yet you could say that Moscow is really the gateway to Siberia. What's actually in Siberia that is so critical? Why is it that in historical circles, direct discussion of Siberia seems to be avoided? We're talking about 10% of the entire land. And just to give you an idea of what 30 megatons is, on the right there you see the Tsar Bomba, Tsar Bomba, which is the largest nuclear device ever detonated, and to the left of it Castle Bravo, the largest US nuclear device ever detonated. So 30 megatons is somewhere between those two on the right. What kind of force would that be? And of course we're not questioning the validity of nuclear weapons in this exploration. We're assuming that they are very valid. This is a photo of the Tsar Bomba from the plane that dropped it. Supposedly the shock wave from this 50 megaton bomb circled the entire world three times. And of course this was definitely a fear weapon and it goes along with what we're told is the Russian preference to have the largest anything. So of course it'd be the Tsar Bomba like the Tsar Cannon. One of the things I always wondered, though, is those Russians could really build a great camera. I mean, imagine the forces that this camera had to be subjected to in the shockwave that circled the entire planet three times, or so we're told, the planet. But what was really going on with this Tunguska event? 30 megatons is not too far off from that Tsar Bomba. Yes, it's just over 50% of the yield, but still, that's an incredible detonation. And there's other more modern theories that recently seem to have cropped up that say that this meteorite didn't actually strike anything. It bounced off the atmosphere and then it just simply went back up into the sky. What a likely story. What kind of device, uh, excuse me, what kind of natural meteorite just happens to fly down when it's being pulled by the very incredible force of gravity, which scientists assure us exist, and it could just simply bounce off after causing a massive airburst detonation. And here's a depiction of it. Yes, it just flew close to the surface of the Earth and projected some sort of force to level the land, causing a 
30 megaton detonation. To be fair, it's an estimate. They say it's 8 to 30 megatons, but on the high side, 30 megatons. What exactly was going on with this Tunguska event? So many anomalies with it, and this is what it looks like today. You still see that there's an area where the trees don't grow. You have to consider, though, that perhaps the on-site accounts were not exactly accurate. But then you consider what happened at the observatory in Ireland, where they say there was an eerie glow that you could read a newspaper at night. What kind of force or device or whatever actually causes that? Where the entire sky was lit up to a glow that illuminated the sky, and they say there was no moon at that time, and there was no natural illumination that would enable that. What was really the intention, or what really happened in Siberia? This just adds to the mystery of this vast tract of land. And when I say that historians tend not to talk about it, there's only some very peripheral historical events that even seem to occur around Siberia. It's not to say that Siberia doesn't have a history. You've got some scattered accounts of various do-gooders from the West who went to Siberia to try to bring healing for people, various doctors and nurses and other missionaries that went through the area. But yet the official history of it always seems to be glossed over for a variety of reasons. And how accurate were these photos? Because remember, the scientific, scientific expedition didn't get there until nearly 20 years after the fact. So in conclusion, what do we have in Siberia? And what do I think we have? Well, we look at our five eras theory, and we consider where Siberia falls into that, because Siberia seems to be something that indicates a previous civilization. Perhaps we're looking at the remnants of the Tartarian era, or the fourth era, the civilization that preceded ours, that are very clear, especially in the Lena Pillars. Now, could they be much older? Of course they could. But they seem to have a uniformity to them that is very impressive. And imagine if that really was the remnants of a city that was subjected to some terrifying forces. It had to be some sort of extraordinary advanced civilization. And what about the megaliths? Well, perhaps something from the foundation areas. The earlier eras that we believe that we built subsequent civilizations to include the civilization that preceded ours on top of. And then, of course, you had the Tunguska event that occurred in the contemporary era. Something that was either artificial or a natural event that wiped out, destroyed a lot of what remains, a lot of the evidence. But what do you think of all this? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.